So we're down here in Conway, Arkansas today, and um, we, we have some additional participants that are off the, uh, the screen here that you might be hearing occasionally. They uh, are of the canine species that uh, they're adding their commentary occasionally. So uh, <laughs> we'll just practice with that. Um, it's good to see everybody this morning. Uh, so I'm just going to get right into it here and we'll, we'll keep on uh, continuing this uh, text. Let me make sure everything's turned on here. Yeah. So this is uh, Makahanya Haramitsu, the uh, second chapter of Shovel Genzo that uh, we just started talking about last week. And um, this text is, uh, you know, we really need to study the Heart Sutra in order to understand it. Of course, this is kind of Dogen Zenji's uh, commentary on the Heart Sutra. So I gave some talks a couple of years ago on uh, the Heart Sutra, really kind of knowing that we would, you know, eventually talk about this text, or of course the Heart Sutra in itself is a very important text <laughs> to study, but I wanted to make sure that it would be there in, you know, in case people wanted to study study that uh, too. And of course, there are some great commentaries out there in the Heart Sutra, but we'll, um, we'll kind of you know, try to incorporate all of it as we go, but I'm, of course, I'm not gonna be able to cover the Heart Sutra you know, thoroughly. So I'm assuming that everybody's read it and is somewhat familiar with it. And um, as I say, just, you know, study those commentaries or look at the videos of the talks that I gave before or you know if you have some question about about that we can bring it up you know in the question and answer portion so so we're really at the very beginning uh, of the the text here and so Dogen Zenji's uh, writing goes like this the first line it says the time of Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva practicing profound prajna paramita is the whole body clearly seeing the emptiness of all five aggregates. So just to remind you, I mean, we could uh, go over or uh, state the, the Heart Sutra's first uh, you know, first line, it's very similar. The first two lines of these two texts are very similar. So the Heart Sutra says, <clears throat> Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, when deeply practicing Prajna Paramita, clearly saw that all five aggregates are empty <clears throat> and thus relieved all suffering. So, first of all, uh, we need to know, you know, who Avalokiteshvara is. So many of us are familiar with him or her. She's a very uh, famous and important bodhisattva in uh, Mahayana Buddhism and in Zen, you know, in particular. So, <clears throat> you know, a bodhisattva, of course, is uh, a, a being that is um, an awakening being, a, a being that is uh, on the path usually. We think of uh, a bodhisattva as on the path to awakening. But, um, you know, this word took on different meanings through the history of Buddhism. And, you know, I won't go into all of that, but in these kind of uh, big bodhisattvas, you know, we're all bodhisattvas when we take the bodhisattva vow. Um, that means we vow to awaken with all beings. And so we're kind of, uh, you know, minor bodhisattvas <laughs> compared to these uh, big bodhisattvas, uh, we could say that um, they represent, you know, in my understanding, actually reality itself, just they're viewed from a different perspective or they emphasize a sort of different um, aspect of the teachings and the practice and of reality itself. So this Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva is not a being that is not awakened yet. Even in the most, you know, more traditional Mahayana text, 
Um, I'm not going to get into all that history of Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, but uh, basically we need to know that this Bodhisattva represents compassion. When we see um, reality or when we practice with reality from the perspective of compassion. And human beings, you know, are limited uh, beings. <laughs> so we need to see this reality. We need to kind of view it or practice with it or, you know, uh, approach it uh, in our everyday life from a certain perspective. And, you know, as we talked about last time, we kind of nurture our understanding or our, our intellect by um, approaching this reality from a certain perspective, even though no perspective, of course, can incorporate the entire reality. But uh, Avalokiteshvara so is, represents uh, compassion. Wisdom and compassion are inseparable. Of course, that's what is part of what this text is saying. Uh, but Avalokiteshvara, the actual word, you know, can be translated as either um, seer of the sounds of the world or um, regarder, you know, of the sounds of the world, or sometimes you see it translated as uh, um, hear, hearer of the cries of the world. So, um, or no, seer, yes, regarder, seer, there, it's not hearer. This is a kind of an important point. It's not hearer, it's um, usually seer or regarder of the cries of the world or the sounds of the world. Another translation, um, another way it can be translated is uh, the Bodhisattva that sees liberation or that um, sees freely. So uh, either one of these translations, I think emphasize that we are liberated, you know, by uh, Avalokiteshvara. Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva is liberation. And in Dogen Zenji's teaching here, and I think in the Heart Sutra, Avalokiteshvara is our Zazen practice. So we're not talking about some, you know, being out there who is going to uh, regard the five skandhas and see it and then save themselves or save us. But this is uh, Zazen practice itself. And so, and so often in Dogen Zenji's text, he gives you the whole shebang in the first line, you know, the whole <laughs> uh, deep, you know, meaning of the entire text uh, in the, in the whole, uh, in the first line. And then you know, proceeds to kind of expound on it somewhat. So, you know, Avalokiteshvara, it's very interesting in Dogen Zenji's uh, line here. He's, and he did this purposely, but I didn't translate this from the Japanese, of course, but my teacher did. And when he translated it, he said he kept intentionally, you know, uh, Dogen Zenji's very deliberate um, emphasis on time. So he said, usually in the Heart Sutra, it says Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, but in Dogen Zenji's uh, part here, he says the time of Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva. And there's a way that, um, you know, the Japanese uh, is structured that it's clear that time is the subject of the, of the sentence and the time of Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva. So, you know, <laughs> Dogen Zenji, the teaching of time was very important to him and very important to Shakyamuni Buddha. You know, impermanence is one of the basic fundamental teachings of uh, Buddhism, of all, you know, all teachings of Buddhism. But Dogen Zenji had a very interesting way, you know, of talking about time. And so he, you know, basically we usually say Dogen Zenji said that time and being are one. So it's really a different way of express, expressing the reality of emptiness. We usually think, 
you know, time is out there separate from us. And then what we do is somehow placed into time. And then our body and mind is uh, kind of walks onto this stage or somehow involved in this stage of linear time flowing. But um, Dogen Zenji and, you know, I think really the teachings tell us that this time idea of time as something separate from us is kind of a, you know, a delusion. We have to view it from that perspective at, at times in order to, you know, conduct our life. But the reality of the way our life unfolds is that we are time and we are a phenomenon. You know, we are not a fixed being without, uh, that is somehow separate from change or, or time. And uh, all time, you know, is interconnected that all of us are sharing the same now. And we have shared this now uh, with all beings in the past and future. And this time is the also the time of Zazen, the time of doing Zazen. So uh, this is related to Dogen Zenji's teachings of practice and enlightenment awakening are one so when we sit in a zazen and we are letting go of our concepts we're not clinging to the concepts especially these concepts of uh, past and future we are liberated that's the bodhisattva who sees liberation or realizes liberation so um, we, we are free when we let go of uh, this um, idea of past and future as real, as something substantial, and uh, this person as an individual. So we don't believe it, but we can actually, we can actually experience this. It's not some kind of a great Kensho awakening or transcendental, um, you know, lightning bolt. It's just simply uh, when we let go, we can't in any moment be liberated. Uh, we can be free. So we can, you know, bring this liberation off of the cushion too. You know, Sawaki Roshi said something like, um, he paraphrased these kinds of teachings as we're, we, we become pure in Zazen, or we're, we become pure and clean or we manifest the naked self, <laughs> the self that's naked of past and future in comparisons to ourselves in the past or future or, you know, to other beings. So most of our, you know, our suffering, our intellectual suffering, which is different than, you know, physical pain or discomfort, but our real, you know, suffering, like an, our dis-ease with life and our dis-ease with this moment has to do with, uh, setting up some kind of comparison between the way things should be and the way things are and saying, you know, this is not the way it should be. Um, and so we can, you know, we can be liberated from that. And that's, again, that's Juju Zamai, the text that we just uh, studied. The self that is only the self encountering self, you know, not comparing this being to some other being or some other time. So that, and that is also, you know, Avalokiteshvara. We can talk about Jiju Zamai or we can talk about Avalokiteshvara uh, being liberated. So um, last year I was practicing for some ceremonies and I, I would memorize this part of uh, the um, Universal Gateway chapter of the of the Lotus Sutra, where that is that is devoted to Avalokiteshvara, and it's a very uh, devotional text. <laughs> it's when you read this text, a lot of people don't like it because it sounds like something strange. You know, sounds like you're imploring a being to uh, free you from, you know, physical distress or, uh, you know, illness or physically, like asking, I mean, uh, actually literally asking for some kind of deliverance from certain situations, which we usually don't 
associate with Zen, you know. <laughs> um, but the text is saying something more deep than that, actually. But there's part of it that um, I think really relates to that that struck me when I was uh, reading it or when I was memorizing it last fall. And it says, um, the wondrous voice of Avalokiteshvara, Brahma voice, voice of the rolling tides, surpasses all sounds within the world. Therefore, ever keep it in mind. In, e in each thought, with never a doubt, Avalokiteshvara, the pure sage, in pain, agony, or death's distress, can provide a pure support. Fully endowed with all virtues, his eyes of compassion behold all beings, assembling a boundless ocean of happiness. Thus, with reverence, you should make prostrations. So, you know, this, a couple of things about it, when they, when the, the person or people who wrote this said, the voice of Avalokiteshvara is the voice of the rolling tide. And that, I think, is this voice of emptiness. You know, um, Dogen Zenji in this text uh, talked about the way his teacher um, expressed the sound, you know, of emptiness, this wind bell that we'll talk about later. And this wind bell that receives, um, you know, the wind from all directions, not discriminating and yet uh, making an offering indiscriminately, a beautiful sound uh, from the movement of those, that wind. And so I think, you know, the tide is the same way. We think of that as a beautiful sound, you know, the, the kind of water crashing against the shore. But it's very clear it has, it's uh, empty, you know, when we think about the sound and the where um, it comes from and how the tide, uh, the movement of the tide is connected to the wind and the sun and even the moon and the gravitational movement of the earth. And just in that moment, you know, it's expressed. And of course, the movement of the earth, as I often say, is, is um, deeply connected to the sun and uh, the other great bodies, some great black, black hole in the middle of a Milky Way <laughs> that we're revolving around. So it's uh, in that moment, all of that and beyond is expressed in a, in a beautiful sound. So, um, but it's not a human sound. It's not a sound that's uh, trying to, you know, express uh, desire or joy or some kind of limited, you know, human um, perspective, although it includes something much greater than that, you know, that's not negated. But um, so in each thought with never a doubt, the pure sage can provide a pure support in death's distress when we're dying, when we're living, when we're in pain or agony. And um, so that is, that is practice. You know, no being can ever dis, uh, deliver us from every difficult situation. We cannot control this life. You know, we get sick and um, we get well, uh, but sooner or later we, you know, we have to pass away. We get, we get elderly possibly if we're fortunate or if you view that as fortunate or not, but, and then at some time we need to, um, we need to die. And in, in those moments, uh, all of those moments, we can't control them. We have a tiny bit of control over our life. That's the, the conditions of our life. But what we really have control over is the, our relationship with those conditions. And so, you know, keeping Avalokiteshvara in each thought, it's not literally, I think, thinking of Avalokiteshvara, but opening the hand of thought, you know, like um, not 
grasping this thought. So like, as I'm speaking to you now, uh, there's some way that we, I need to, in my, in my body and mind somewhere, not know that what I'm saying isn't really ultimately true or, you know, anything that we think or do is somehow uh, limited because of this uh, reality of emptiness and zazen. So knowing that anything we can say and any experience we have is limited uh, liberates us, actually. We think that it's, we really want to believe in our thoughts. You know, we really want to think that we know what's right and wrong or that we know that we're smart or we're not smart or whatever. But actually letting go and understanding that we have this limited understanding is uh, liberation because then we can let go of those comparisons. We can let go of our suffering, even when it's time, you know, to die. We think of death as, a, you know, a bad thing innately, most of us, and something negative. Our culture definitely thinks we need to avoid it. There's all kinds of anti-aging products out there and, you know, youth culture is, is American culture. Like, you know, that is the coolest thing. And there's nothing wrong with that, but somehow we're all running away from the inevitable uh, impermanence. But, you know, we'll never, we won't escape it. But what we can do is practice with it. And we think that it's a negative thing, but that's just up here. We think, but it's the way of all things. You know, that itself is Buddha, you know, coming and going. None of us can um, survive without the death of other beings. And so, you know, to think that life and death, you know, life is somehow good and death is somehow bad is a really deep delusion. Uh, but, you know, we, <laughs> we don't innately believe that. But with our practice, you know, we can bow to our sickness. We can bow to our death. I mean, it's, it's difficult. It's deep and difficult practice. But that is Avalokiteshvara, Bodhisattva. So, um, this, you know, this never a doubt doesn't mean, I think, an intellectual doubt. But the doubt uh, is, you know, the doubt is grasping. You know, never without a doubt uh, means practice, letting go of everything in some moment, you know, um, understanding in some way. So it's a kind of, uh, you know, it's a kind of faith, but it's a faith that's verified by reality. So it's not a blind faith that we don't, that someone tells us and we just have to believe it. Actually, when we start studying uh, the nature of reality, the nature of our life, we see emptiness is the reality. And that's the way, you know, we're liberated to see that these comparisons we make and our own suffering isn't real, you know, in the way that we think it is. So, um, so this is a different kind of faith than kind of blind faith that somebody tells us. This is what we verify, you know, in our own life and practice. So let's see. All right. Um, I'm trying to decide how far I'll go. <laughs> All right. Another really interesting thing about um, this line in Dogen Zenji's uh, commentary, the only thing that's fundamentally different, the only word that he added, he actually took out a word, some words, and he added... Um, a word, this word he added uh, his whole body. So the time of Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva practicing profound Prajnaparamita is the whole body clearly seeing the emptiness of the five aggregates. So, you know, whole body, this is a really interesting term and it comes from um, probably a koan, or it does come from a koan. 
it's uh, there's different versions, but it's um, case 52 of the uh, Book of Serenity in case anyone's interested in looking that up. But it's a conversation between two great um, Zen ancestors, Ungan and Dogo, who were actually brothers. And um, anyway, I won't go into the koan because it's, uh, there's a lot. Uh, Dogo says you wrote a whole chapter of Shogo Genzo on it, and it's a lot. But um, basically this whole body is means the whole body of reality. You know, uh, the whole, so it can mean this whole body and mind we practice with our entire body and mind. But just as the voice, you know, of the rolling tide is the voice of the entire universe or all reality, our practice, of course, uh, is supported or a manifestation of that. Um, so, you know, when we think that we're somehow just uh, one small part of this reality practicing, um, there's kind of a, a big delusion there. You know, as I often say, none of us could be meeting here today. Um, I couldn't be sitting here on this spot without floating off into space, without gravity, as we, we spoke of a moment ago. And without the countless um, practice, uh, countless people who practiced and the countless teachers who preserved this these teachings and many, many other things. Um, that of course, we we get down to the beginning of everything and before when we start really seeing, you know, what it takes to support one's practice or one's life. And so, you know, this koan is a very interesting one because it talks about the difference or the interconnection between the individual person and this whole body. And, um, you know, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, the traditional way that he or she is represented, one of the traditional, like, kind of tantric ways is that they have a thousand arms and a thousand hands with an eye on each um, hand. And that's in order to see what... Uh, beings need and to do and that's an order you know they the Bodhisattva sees the cries of the world <laughs> and uh, they have hands to help and so it's very interesting you know that this it's not uh, hearing the sounds of the world but this seeing uh, uh, kind of emphasizes the um, non-duality of subject-object relationship usually it's a way of going beyond this thing of saying, um, you know, there's an object of the eye and I see it. Actually, but when we, you know, when we hear, uh, when we see sounds, there's some way I think we, this is implied that we're going beyond this subject object relationship in order, you know, we are actually one with Avalokiteshvara. But um, anyway, the, the koan is about, you know, what does the Bodhisattva do with these hands and eyes? And the, you know, the answers the, the brothers give is that the whole body is hands and eyes. You know, it's not like there are hands there that some Bodhisattva is manipulating, but um, each individual is the Bodhisattva. You know, there is no separation between the Bodhisattva hands and eyes. There's no separation between uh, this reality and practice, the individual, and um, and compassion. And yet, you know, if, if we don't, you know, if we don't uh, kind of step up and practice, uh, it's kind of a question whether we're liberated or not, because we, you know, we continue to suffer and we continue to make uh, deep mistakes without, you know, actually practicing in this reality. So it's an important part of, um, to understand about this text, because if we don't, if we're not careful, it sounds like 
anything goes, that Dogen Zenji is saying everything we encounter is Avalokiteshvara or Prajnaparamita, therefore anything goes and it's all okay, just do whatever you feel. And that's absolutely not, you know, what he's saying. So we need to be very careful uh, when we study this text. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of a, that whole body is a kind of another way, you know, a beautiful way of uh, saying that this Zazen practice is um, space itself. So the, to say it's time, I think, you know, it's, it's the time of practicing Zazen and then the space is kind of including both as one. You know, there's no difference between Avalokiteshvara and the time of practice. And there's no difference between, um, you know, the time of practice and the five skandhas and uh, space. So um, he's talking about this from different perspectives. But so, you know, in this moment of sitting, Avalokiteshvara clarifies uh, reality and uh, the emptiness of the five skandhas. So um, trying to decide whether I want to go on or not. Maybe I should stop here <laughs> because there's a, a lot more to talk about in this this piece but um, I'm gonna try to maybe just uh, stay within our time limits that we were supposed to have originally more these days so because I think there's a lot there we've already talked you know about a lot and um, I don't have to finish this by any you know date or anything so maybe we'll stop there for today um, so we've kind of clarified, you know, what this Avalokiteshvara is and what this whole body is. And, um, well, you know, clarified intellectually, but the only way to clarify that is to what we did this morning uh, before this and sit Zazen. <laughs> so uh, that was kind of a, a mistaken way of saying that. But, uh yeah, so next time we'll talk about this practicing profound prajna paramita and this clear seeing of the five aggregates. Okay, um, well, let's see. Is there anything? Okay, I think that's all I'll say about that today. Is there anything anybody wanted to say this morning about any of this or an observation or question? I, I, I do think I have a, a question um, or, or just something to, to clarify. Um, I, I think I've mentioned in these a, a few times that like my you know religious background is Christianity and I know a hell of a lot more about you know uh, Christian scripture and etc. than uh, like various different Buddhist sutras, and I'm kind of just trying to familiarize myself with I, I don't know I, I guess the Buddhist canon. I, I don't know that that's even a, even a phrase. From from what I understand, it seems to be not not really a thing. Um, but uh, so the Harp Sutra, which I have read, that's part of a larger sutra, right? Is, is that accurate or? Um, it's uh, it's its own thing actually, but it's okay. kind of a uh, it's sort of a you know a very concise expression of a body okay. of work called the Prajna Paramita Sutras. You know that are okay. kind of, uh, expanding right. emptiness or talking about okay. emptiness. Yeah, for for me, I think like my only real encounter with I guess Buddhism before starting my Zazen practice and and uh, a few kind of like popular books, you know, I, I, I guess that, that I've read since then was kind of a like uh, a middle school world religions class. And I ended up writing a paper on Buddhism. But I think the Buddhism that I encountered was definitely very different, definitely more uh, 
uh, I, I would say Theravada and at least the way that it was presented by Western sources, almost a fundamentalist Theravada that I don't think is really representative of actual Theravada practitioners. And, and I'm kind of trying to just, I, I guess, familiarize myself with the rest of the landscape that, uh, that is Buddhism as opposed to that, I, I think, very limited view. Um, and and uh, just, I, I guess, where would you suggest starting in, in that, you know, that endeavor? <laughs> they're a good place i don't know that there is you know i mean is there's probably books you there's books you can read and i'm trying to think of the ones that i really um okay. think are good for this kind of thing of sort of okay. uh clarifying some of these differences yeah. because like like christianity you know in christianity there are yeah. just what? hundreds of different what? traditions what? and interpretations right. of of um the scriptures and what you know the teachings of jesus and um and buddhism is the same you know the same way uh so um uh, you know one thing that we usually make this kind of big dichotomy between early buddhism and then later you know we mahayana buddhism so it's and a lot of times you hear me talking about trying to uh make the connection back between the two because it does seem like sometimes there's a huge gap so yeah. to me in one of my uh the kind of um one of the ways that i would really express it is like uh you know early buddhism and even the earliest stuff that we have is still recorded hundreds of years after the buddha died a couple of hundred years after the buddha died so you know, it's not like there's any pure text that is unadulterated by human interpretation, you know, but we tend to think kind of like Christianity in that way, if you think about it. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, some of those early Buddhist schools will tell you this is the literal thing that the Buddha taught because this is the earliest record. And um, and there are there is evidence, you know, that that stuff, some of that stuff, especially the earliest stuff might really contain the historical uh, repetition of what Shakyamuni said, you know, the, the actual historical Buddha. But um, anyway, uh, to me, um, you know, early Buddhism, it was very clear that the kind of approach was uh, we're, we're in this thing called samsara in which we're cycling in this um, cycle of rebirth and each moment also contains this kind of cycle of suffering into different psychological states and emotional states. But uh, the real endeavor was to um, escape this uh, cycle, you know, of um, rebirth. And um, so I, I'm sure from the earliest days, there were people who uh, interpreted this, you know, differently, I'm sure. But that's kind of the, the traditional, you know, way of um, talking about Buddhism. And uh, the Buddha back at that time, or, you know, the early text, to me, we can kind of boil it down into the fact that uh, the Buddha never talked about emptiness except for the emptiness of the self. You know, that's all he was willing to comment on. And so he was uh, very wise to me. My interpretation is, is that he was very wise uh, and he left, you know, um, the possibility open for much kind of deeper insight or um, interpretation, you know, because he never made a dichotomy between the self and the object of, of our senses. So he never made a distinction between these five skandhas and an external world. So um, Mahayana Buddhism, and I don't want to get into the woods too much here, but Mahayana Buddhism decided to go ahead and make the mistake of saying everything, you know, is empty. And, you know, uh, everything that, uh, you know, we can think of in terms of an, of an objective world. But um, 
you know, you kind of make a mistake to say that. And I think the Buddha was just sort of, uh, as I say, a wise person. And he realized that you couldn't say really whether there's an objective world or not. And if you do say that the self is empty, you're saying that all experience, you know, is, is empty. And you don't really have to comment on the, whether or not things really exist or not outside of the self, you know. And, I, you know, Dogen Genji, it comes back to that, I think. And uh, Mahayana Buddhism, you know, returns to that. And I think, um, actually, Mahayana Buddhism was an attempt to come back to the original teachings, a kind of reformation, at least in the eyes of Mahayana Buddhists. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I'm trying to think of a good book. Um, there's a... Uh, I can't I, think I, of the I one found off the top one of my head now, but there are some that kind of lay okay. out this kind of uh, historical mm -hmm. understanding of where the schools uh, relate to each other. And we don't know exactly, of course, mm -hmm. yeah. a kind of broad overview in, of um, how they relate to each other. Yeah. And uh, okay. if you email me, I will, I will come back and remember that there's one that I really like. Maybe someone else has a favorite one that they can remember that just kind of, you know, clearly uh, points these things out, which I think is what you're looking for, Austin, just to kind of make a sense of what yeah. these things relate right. to each other. It, it's that same kind of uh, the the thing you were saying. And, and, I, and I've realized, and, and at least for me, as someone who's studied Christian history a decent bit, I've realized that there seem to be a decent number of parallels <laughs> in terms of, okay, you know, Original founder said X, Y, Z, didn't really write anything down. Followers wrote things. Uh, people interpreted it this way. Split off into these groups, blah, blah, blah. Reformation, you know. Um, um, but but I think, um, yeah, that, that that's kind of the, you know, a, a summary of that so that I don't misunderstand something or, you know, impose like that that parallel that, that I'm seeing more than it actually exists. But uh, yeah, yeah, that, that that I guess is just kind of, you know. Uh, Trying try to familiarize myself with the landscape that is that is Buddhism. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a good point because I think it's uh, very confusing today because there are so many different sources of information, and you get you go to one source and you get a completely different message. It seems like than you do in a different place, and they are connected. I mean, there are certain things that we can say. You know, like the four Dharma seals. If if this teaching is a teaching of Buddhism, it will have these four things. Um, and even though, you know, teachings might seem really contradictory or completely different, there is a way that they, you can see the connection between them too. But without a little bit of understanding of the overall context, it's kind of difficult and confusing and we don't know um, how to proceed. So in my mind, um, that's why it's kind of important to when we really want to go deeply into our practice is to stick with one tradition, not because, you know, not because one has to be the tradition, you know, the, the Buddha uh, was really against dogma. That was one of his primary teachings, no dogmas, you know, no kind of um, ultimate uh, one tradition has to be the ultimate truth, so to speak. But um, if we don't uh, penetrate, you know, deeply into one tradition, we we can only go so deep. I mean, it depends on, you know, what we want to do. We can either go very deep or you, know, you can go very broad, but that's more of like a scholastic approach. You know, that's more of an intellectual approach. But if we want to know what this really means in our life, I think it's better to stick with one tradition. Yeah. So let me know if you're interested in a book or two, uh, I'll, I'll think of it. I just can't think of it right. Uh, there's one that I, I like a lot that would be good if you're interested in that. Thank you. You're welcome.
Russ, good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Can you hear me okay? Uh, it's a little, little soft, maybe. Okay. Okay. It's the second problem we had before. Uh, 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 uh. Are other folks here in How about now? Or? Is that is that better? Yes, that's better for me. Okay. So um, this this phrase about practicing the profound uh, practices the whole body clearly seeing emptiness. Um, it reminds me of a line, and I, and I can't find it right now. I think it was from Bukhin Zazengi. Um, but uh, a line about as soon as you, oh, when you sit down, all dullness and distraction are put aside. And uh, it, it's always um, struck me as curious that he doesn't say, uh, if you practice right, all dullness and distraction is set aside. You know, he says it all just, just you know, absolute, all dullness and distraction is set aside. And, um, I guess it's always been a koan for me because, you know, when I sit down, uh, definitely all dullness and distraction is not set aside. <laughs> dullness and distraction may be set aside uh, once or twice during a, a given period, or it may go several days without dullness and distraction being set aside. So it it's kind of like it it it's uh it reminds me a little bit of, of his basic question you know do we uh we're, we're already if we're already enlightened if we're already uh not separate from from basic reality why do we need to practice um kind of what happens with that with respect to our time our time of of practicing Prajna Paramita, the time we're sitting on the cushion. Um, what happens, uh, it, 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 what happens, you know, you, you, we say, well, when we experience those, those moments where we experience that oneness, it, it enables us to go, oh yeah, it's, look, this, is, this is pretty good. Um, but what about those many moments where it's not automatically dullness and distraction are set aside. I guess, I guess my, you know, it's kind of reminds me of, does a, does a dog have Buddha nature? You know, uh, my, I guess my question is, does a distracted student have Buddha nature, you know, um, or in those moments where there's much distraction going on? So I, you know, I, it's like, how much do we, how much, you know, I know, and I, and I know that the, the basic answers to all this, the, the basic answer is no, we're not, we're not trying to achieve any kind of state and we have to allow the thoughts to come and go but the 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 um it's kind of a, a question is there something going on still in those moments where dullness and distraction don't seem to be set aside at all yeah well that's a great question it's uh you know i'll give a limited uh answer to that there's a lot of things mm -hmm. that, I, that were coming through my mind but um basically i'll just say for my own uh from my own experience um uh, yes there there i think we we say um what we say zazen actually is is this this letting go you know this letting go of whether we're in dullness or distraction or not. So we don't ever, um, so it's a kind of faith. And uh, I think what Dogen Zenji is saying in that line is that we go beyond the subject object relationship and we go beyond this dichotomy between ourselves, you know, and our practice. And so for me, uh, my understanding is really at this point is that we cannot really know that in the way that we think of knowing, you know, because knowing is limited. The, it, the usual thing that we associate with knowing is, 
is involved in the subject object relationship. So it's a very uh, uncomfortable situation for the intellect and for the body and mind to be aiming at a target in which it never knows if it hits it or not. <laughs> and that's exactly the medicine we need though. And actually when we do that, our life is somehow healed. So I don't really know how to say it, but we want to know whether, you know, we're hitting the mark or not. But the whole idea of hitting the mark or not is steeped in uh, an approach that isn't really relevant so much or part of the, the problem. But it doesn't mean, uh, you know, that our life isn't changed or transformed. So when we, um, when we shift the aim of our life from getting this knowing or from getting this uh, experience to expressing uh, reality, it's a, a deep shift. Uh, so I don't, I hope that's somewhat helpful, but uh, I think um, the experience of Zazen is not the point. And yet those, those times of, uh, you know, distraction and dullness are part of the point, the, the time of hitting the mark where dullness and distraction is set aside and um, whatever the true dragon takes to the water or the tiger enters the uh, <laughs> enters the forest, you know, the way he uses those kind of uh, really intense images. All of those things are part of it. And in, in the moment of, um, in the time, you know, beyond time, uh, these kind of dichotomies don't hold up, you know, don't, don't matter. And um, when we, when our life is steeped in that, then we, we find uh, our suffering dissipates. So, um, you know, it's not as if we're just doing this for, uh, to be a good boy or a good girl. <laughs> Although, you know, uh, it's definitely not just, it's not in the service of just this five skandhas. You know, we, we're clear about that. But when we make this offering of five skandhas to the whole body, then we are also, you know, healed. And another thing about it too, um, a Zazen practice, we start to see the emptiness of the mind too on a relative uh, level. So after some years or some days or weeks or whatever of sitting Zazen and all of these dullness and distraction states coming up um, and all of this letting go of each of them, we really see how we don't have to believe in them. You know, we really, we don't have to hit the mark of complete oneness, you know, in some experience. That's just not the way it works, I think. <laughs> I mean, we, we might have that experience or we might think we have an experience, but any experience is limited even if we think it's beyond the, the subject object relationship. This is my understanding at this point. So um, we can't rely on experience. And yet we are taught and we're guided and we're pulled apart and by Zazen, you know, and we're taught and we're nurtured and um, we're healed, you know, by this, way of practice. Let's see, Dakota has a hand up. Yeah, thank you. Good morning for you. Um, this kind of, this, this, this discussion kind of reminds me of um, something that 
that Suzuki Roshi said in Zen Mind Beginner's Mind is that he was he was describing some of the some of the difficulties faced in Zazen practice, and he said that um, you know in in regards to a disciple or something like that, he said you're frustrated because you think that your practice is lackluster, haphazard, something like that. He's basically saying that you're frustrated because you think you had a bad practice, but the fact that you know that you had a bad practice is actually good practice, but because of your your dualistic conceptual understanding, you are stuck in the concept that your practice was bad. So this raises the question in my mind, can it be understood that the dullness, distraction, pain, suffering, whatever it may be, that are typically considered as distractions when one is trying to concentrate, is that through this level of intimate awareness that we create and and apply to whatever it is that's arising in the moment that there's it's it's difficult to to conceptualize and kind of and summarize this question that i have but is it through the intimate awareness itself that the dullness or distraction is eliminated to the very awareness of dullness and distraction itself does that make sense Yeah, I think so. I, I think, uh, you know, it reminds me of something else that Suzuki Roshi said, I believe, and um, he talked about our delusions, or he compared them, you know, our delusions in Zazen to weeds. You know, that um, and actually the weeds, uh, you know, life, the garden couldn't really survive. None of us could survive without the weeds. You know, if we, if we didn't have those things um, that um, nurture all different kinds of beings and go back into the soil and nurture the vegetables that we, that nurture our life, um, we couldn't have a garden. You know, we couldn't have a garden without, um, let's say by Austin, uh, you know, we couldn't have a garden without um, the weeds and actually, you know, a weed and a good, and a good plant is a total human discrimination. Like <laughs> we call one thing, a weed in one situation and we call it uh, an ornamental flower in another situation sometimes, you know? Um, so, uh, you know, Zazen itself goes beyond this kind of dichotomy between, you know, weeds and flowers, you know, in Genjo Koan, he says flowers fall even though we like them and weeds sprout even though we don't like them. And he also says, there's something in there that you, that uh, reminded me of what you said is that, um, you know, he says when the Dharma fills, or when you, when you think the Dharma fills your body and mind, you're deluded. And when you realize that something is still lacking, the Dharma actually fills your body and mind. So uh, part of the process, yes, is, is accepting our limitations and the fact that we uh, have a limited viewpoint. And then we can take those you know, weeds and nurture them and make them into, not make them, but allow them. <laughs> we don't make anything happen. We allow them to be as they are without the label of, you know, weeds and um, flowers or good and bad, you know, plants and allow them to manifest as Prajnaparamita. So, you know, one of the ways we talk about it too, when, Doga, when uh, Ucha Maroshi talks about opening the hand of thought, and we talked about this, you know, line ZZ uh, diagram that he made. So one of the you know, there's this line ZZ where we're totally present and no thoughts are distracting us. And then we go <clears throat> away from that line in Zazen. We're either thinking or we're sleeping, you know. And one way to express it, and I think even this diagram is sort of limited to, and I, he would be probably the first one to acknowledge that, but it's a kind of a good tool. Uh, so... He said that, you know, this distraction line, when we go off the distraction line, the real awakening happens when we return to this line. When we, in other words, when we let go, 
you know, Dogen Zenji called that dropping off body and mind. It's relaxing. It's not, you know, it's relaxing into this moment. And, um, you know, when we think about it, there is none of, there's no letting go unless we have the weed. <laughs> so it's, all of those things are sort of necessary. Um, and there's no way a human being can live without discrimination. You know, um, there's no way we can survive without thinking and uh, our imagination. Yet, if we cling to those things as real, you know, as that they are the deepest delusion. Uh, but when we let go and allow them, you know, to manifest the Dharma, then, you know, they are Dharma. But we, you know, we need them. So uh, that those kind of things remind me of what you're you're saying, I think. And we we don't, uh, you know, in our zazen practice, we don't try to cultivate any kind of awareness or, or knowledge. In my understanding, I think in Dogen Zenji's teaching, but we receive gifts. You know, if we cultivate or if we're asking for something here and there, it's like, uh, you know, we're just in our own agenda. But when we settle down um, and we uh, devote ourselves to our quiet, simple practice, we receive gifts, you know, we receive some insight about these five skandhas. And uh, we receive some insight about the way to proceed and um, allow our life to be one of awakening. But if we pursue those things, uh, they're not, a, you know, they don't come. <laughs> this is my experience because we don't know what to ask for even. And the asking is part of the delusion, you know. So we just settle down and we receive the gifts. Uh, but we have to become, uh, you know, kind of quiet, I think, to uh, receive them. Let's see. Okay. Uh, let's see. Lacey and Mahesh had hands up. Oh, thank you. I'm sure you can say. You're welcome. Uh, I just want to say, like, uh, mm, I'm really grateful because there are many things that are calling to be explored. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Uh, like I have been reading this text um, um, many times uh, before I went before I was in in Gilbert City. I read it also in, in my well, in, 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 in Colombia, but I have never like figured out like the importance of time of Avalokiteshvara and the whole body is like wow. It's, it's, there's a lot of information there. And like, I just want to, like the, uh, eight, eight days ago, we, I, I tried to express one idea. This idea was like in Sassen, it's, uh, Sassen integrates almost all the most important truths in human activities or something like that. It's like, a, it's a really deep practice. Um, but it's like difficult for me to realize how deep it is that like it is difficult to realize how this simple act it's so profound and uh like with your teaching today it's like wow it's really profound and like it makes sense when with with our experience maybe especially with sessions like it's like wow <laughs> So I just want to be, to, I have many ideas. I would like to continue talking, but I also want to respect uh, your time and the time of others. So I will finish just thanking thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ryushan. Thank you.
Okay, and Mahesh had had something. Uh, I have um, so I'm, I'm reading uh, opening the hand of thought about uh, how to do zazen, and um, it talks about primarily two things. One is uh, aiming uh, at the posture or uh, aiming to hold the posture vigorously. I may not be uh, stating it correctly, but uh, um, physically, like with, with, with flesh and bones, trying to aim at the posture uh, with full of life and full of energy and then uh, letting off thought. Um, it says like doing these two things uh, as part of Zazen, like uh, primarily. Um, so... So it looks like we let go of thought. I always had this question of when we let go of thought, what do we do with the mind? But it looks like when I read that description more carefully, it says you, you sit, you sit with uh, like with the body, with flesh and bones, aiming at the posture. That's that's what you do. Um, and then if you realize you're caught up in thought, just again let go. But after you let go, you're not doing anything with the mind. You're you're sitting with the body. Um, so I read somewhere just just sitting is a dynamic activity. You're sitting moment by moment. So um, it's not a static activity that you just you're, you're sitting. Um, so when we come back, when we awaken from the thought, and when we come back, so it looks like we aim at the posture. We aim at sitting. Um, so how do what do we do then like uh, um do we do we try to sit moment by moment like i mean we are already in the posture we're holding the posture but um how do we do that sitting um because it's not a mind activity anymore it looks like it's a physical thing that you're doing yeah uh, it's a really interesting you know question and it's a really um you know deep one i think and uh because in our understanding and i think in my understanding and i think dogen zinji's understanding you know the mind and the body we don't find any separation between them and yet it's clear they're not the same thing <laughs> You know, when we talk about the body, we talk about the body. And when we talk about the mind, you know, we talk about the mind. But when we f try to find some clear distinction between the two, we never find it. So it's kind of like, you know, our life in general. It's very, um, it's ungraspable. Uh, but I think in my, you know, my experience and my understanding is, um, really to try to sit with this these flesh this flesh and bones is a probably probably the most succinct description so i think you know usually we center our life up here that's the easy thing you know we usually kind of think of our life going on up here you know think of it or we experience what we experience here but there's something that happens uh, when we put our body in a certain position um, where that isn't promoted as much, you know. Uh, so um, when we sit in this posture, this is one way to do it. There, the gravity and the open element of the you know lower part of the body. Um, somehow it's like i mean to me it's like we let we just let uh things sort of settle down and there's no kind of activity that we have to do up here you know that that's our problem is that we we think that we live up here or we think this is the reality and it's very difficult just to sort of give up give over to our body you know give it up to the the uh the posture but there is some way i think when we sit in this upright way that um something happens you know this is a kind of yoga traditional yogic understanding i guess i don't <laughs> usually we don't talk about it in this these terms but you know uchama Roshi, i think in, in uh opening the hand of thought he kinds of he calls it a kind of 
way or he says you know the blood there's less blood flowing up into the mind or the the brain and that's part you know that's part of the reason that we're not so caught up in thinking or um to me it's uh you know when we open the hand we're just kind of relaxing you know we're not doing something as i often say we're walking around like this most of the time you know, grasping this up here in our body and in our mind. It's not, it's not even an intellectual thing. It's our body. You know, you, you can see it when people are, when they're caught up in their, and they're anxious or, you know, they're kind of walking around like this or even in opening the hand of thought, he, he shows the pictures of Rodan's thinker, you know, crunched, hunched over. <laughs> And, you know, all this stuff you can see, you know, it's going on, but it's a closed in thing. The body, you know, kind of implodes on itself. And then you contrast that with Zazen, which is open. And, um, you know, this bottom part of the, in the Tanden is sent the center of our kind of being, you know, our life. The kind of so um, we just kind of give it over to the to the posture, and it's it's kind of it's difficult for us because we we want to we think this is what matters, you know. But it doesn't matter so much as we think, and we can relax, you know. We can just relax it. Um, you know, Ishu Fujita, a, a person that I like, uh, you know, the way he talks about Zazen a lot. He talks about it in terms of balance and, you know, the body just coming into balance, you know, just keeping a, our balance in the, in the Zazen posture. Because a lot of times when we're thinking or sleeping, we're kind of, you know, off balance. Uh, and our thinking becomes sort of off balance, you know. So, yeah, I think we just relax. It's one way to talk about it is we relax the mind somewhat and it may be busy and it may be quiet, but we don't really kind of let it define us, you know, and we just give over and we try to stay in balance in this moment with our flesh and bones. We, we aim at the posture of Zazen. You know, Dogen Zenji said, that is the Buddha mudra. You know, when we get into this posture, we're manifesting Buddha. Like this is a way a Buddha manifests. And, um, you know, the old teaching about a mudra was literally a yogic practice where you do something with your hand and it was supposed to call a Buddha or it was supposed to, um, you know, manifest a certain kind of energy or influence the universe in some way by, you know, doing this or some kind of thing. I mean, the esoteric, <laughs> the Vajrayana teachings that people still use, do these things, you know, but um, Dogu Zenji said that posture is Buddha, like that's the mudra that expresses Buddha. I mean, that's Gyo Butsu. When you sit in that posture fully, you know, um, you, it's not you. <laughs> so, so uh, I'm, I'm going to stop, but uh, it makes me, reminds me of certain things. You may remember in, um, it might be the Homeless Kodo book. Uh, but somewhere Sawaki Roshi talks about the experience he had when he was a, a young, I think it was before he was ordained, actually. He, I can't remember exactly, but um, he practiced, he stayed at Heiji for a while. He walked all the way there from his home and they wouldn't let him in to, as a monk because he wasn't ordained and he was desperate. He, his life had fallen apart. He tried to escape, you know, his uh, abusive, dysfunctional family and he, he escaped. Um, and so uh, I can't remember exactly the story, but one, 
one time uh, the whole community of monks went into town in order to do some ceremony or something and he couldn't go because he wasn't a monk or he had to stay behind for some reason and um, he wasn't allowed to sit in the zendo so uh, he went into the a closet and started doing zazen <laughs> and um, there was some there was like an, an older lady there who who was really was always like after him and telling him what to do and it kind of abusing him you know like this young kid and trying to whip him into shape and she opened that closet and found him in there and uh, saw him doing zazen and she did prostrations she started doing prostrations to him and um, he said in that moment is when he understood you know, the power of Zazen is when he really like was converted. <laughs> when this lady, you know, this lady who really had it in for him, who really, you know, they had this conflict, opened the closet and saw him in there doing Zazen. And he expected, I imagine, her to beat him up and get, tell him to get out. But she did, she started bowing to him. But it wasn't to Sawaki Roshi, that was to, that was to Buddha, in the Buddha Mudra. So uh, these little stories maybe start helping us to understand a little bit more. You're welcome. Thank I'll you. have more questions for it. I'll skip them later. Maybe later. <laughs> on okay. okay. Always. Yeah. What what we do and all. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. Well, we have we have Monday night uh, too. We can talk some more. And it reminds me too. Before I forget, I won't be here next Saturday. So um, we can just do the Buddha Mudra, <laughs> maybe without all of the the talking. But I'm going to be in Los Angeles and. Um, doing some ceremonies there for the 100 year anniversary of Soto Zen. And uh, it's kind of a big thing. So pe people are, the habit of Sojiji is coming over, you know, it's kind of a big deal if you know, if you know that, but um, if you know about Sojiji, it's one of the head temples of the Soto Zen uh, sect, so to speak. Anyway, uh, is there anything else that we need to talk about today? Anything, other comments or questions? Okay, I think what I do uh, is say thank you and bow to you now, and then I do the uh, do the ending verse. So hopefully I'll remember. So thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you.